This is the story of the inner workings of one of the nation's most notorious prisons and the men that live and work behind its walls. Well, I got a murder, first degree murder. I kind of hunted him down, found him one night, and that was all that took place. There was no more after that. He was gone, and I got caught. I made that final choice. I went in that place, and I shot that man. It was my responsibility once I put that gun in my hand. It's plots and subplots, and that's what makes prison great. You know, <laughs> it don't get any better than this. You know what? I couldn't stand to work in a factory. There's, there's not enough excitement in a factory. You taking a shower? Yeah, that's what you're doing. Hey, you're getting all your dirty water on my chair downstairs. What's up with that? Hey, you think that's funny? I don't want to have to walk in your stuff. Do you understand me? You're disrespecting everyone by doing that, all right? Don't do it. Over a 30-day period, the inmates and guards' lives will become dangerously intertwined as the prison faces one of the largest riots in over 20 years. San Quentin, it's California's oldest and most infamous prison. Built in 1852, it's just north of San Francisco in a solidly upper middle class neighborhood. Some of California's most exclusive suburban communities lie within 10 miles of the prison. It's home to many of the state's most brutal criminal and sexual offenders. Notoriously violent and in some areas dangerously overcrowded, the prison has earned a telling nickname. It's called the Arena, and it's where California's most vicious criminals square off. Correctional officer John Gladson has experienced some of this violence firsthand. In his 23 years at San Quentin, he's been kicked, beaten, and stabbed. He's also gained the respect of guards and prisoners alike. All right, Sandy. You know, I got love for you. Gladson makes his morning rounds and checks in on the prison's West Block housing unit where new inmates are about to arrive. All of the inmates coming into West Block are fresh off the bus from the county jails. Most of them have been in the prison system before and are back on parole violations. These guys just got here from county jail. Most of them were violators. Uh, very few uh, first-termers in that group. One thing I always like to look at when the guys come up from county jail is who's sad in that group, not one person. You don't see anybody. They're where they want to be. Gladson passes an area that's a potent reminder of the realities of prison life. The completely exposed outdoor bathrooms. Here, security always trumps privacy. You know, one of the things that brings prison into reality is, is the prison bathroom because there's no privacy. I mean, you sit up here, you, you go to the bathroom, everybody's watching. The guy up here can watch you. The guys on the yard can watch you. And, and it's just, man, I don't know how these guys do it. I really don't. See the pigeon nest right here? See the pigeon nest? See the, the pigeons right there. They go shit on you as soon as you shit in the toilet. Yeah. That's a double shit. Oh, it's, it's all, it's a double crap, double crap. Double shit. Double crap. As soon as you get crapped on, as soon as you crap, you're going to get crapped on. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go into West Block, which is uh, where these guys are going to spend their first night in prison. Donnie, just the guy we was looking for. Officer Danny Atkins heads up the reception center. He's here to handle the basic needs of new inmates. And that can be a tall order. Fresh from the streets. These are men who need help. Either they're physically wore out, they're drug ridden, they're hungry. And we have to fix them. We have to repair them. They come, on, come in here, the first thing they ask is get their teeth pulled, cool, many of them. They're on you know, the different drugs. They lose their teeth. It's a great thing here. It's amazing. This is the revolving door. 
Excuse me, folks. West Block Atkins. West Block inmates receive their first meal here in the mess hall. There's always an increased potential for danger at chow time. That's because it's one of the few times a day when large numbers of inmates are out of their cells simultaneously. Okay, this is the breakfast tray that the fellas are getting right now. It's got grits, two hard-boiled eggs, potatoes, two slices of bread, two bananas, and a milk. Punctuated by menacing gestures or humorous outbursts, meals are rarely uneventful. I want to tell all the kids out there, you don't, you don't want to be like me. You don't want to come to jail. Because if you do your egg, your life is going to be like an egg. The police are going to eventually crack you. As West Block inmates leave the mess halls and return to their cells, the potential for violence is at its peak. Coach, yeah, this is our worst moment right now. Right now, this is the moment when a, a whole tear will erupt. This is a bad sign. We have our gunner up above us just in case for these moments. The goal is simply to get inmates back into their cells without incident. But it's complicated by the fact that, unlike in newer prisons, San Quentin's guards must actually lock each of the over 400 cells by hand. There's also the problem of stragglers. Since most West Block inmates spend over 20 hours a day in their cells, they're in no hurry to get back to them. Many find creative ways to steal an extra moment of freedom. Junior, go on down, brother. Don't make me demonstrate the box. Let's go. Who are you working for? Who are you working for? You are not working for nobody, right? Put your hands on the wall. Where do you live? What are you doing down here? Uh, You're out of bounds. You understand that? Yes, sir. You're in 524? Yes, sir. Take it upstairs now. That's another example where they try to stay out. But what they do, everyone throws all the trash out so we could have runners on the tier. So then once they have a runner, then they could run their messages, their tobacco, and their soups. As Atkins locks each prisoner in, he quickly notes the condition of the inmates and their cells. We're checking inmates. We're checking bodies. We're checking faces for any bruises, if there was any fights. We're also just checking the conditions of the cells. The living conditions is nasty. Safer now. I don't know. They like you. You're a lucky guy. Most of them would be a frequent flyer here, a return. We tend to know them over the years quite well. We become close to them. We know their names. We know their numbers. We start to know their families. We pass out their mail. Many of these men are not here. They're not bad men. They have bad habits. They're not here because they're antisocial. Sometimes they're just too social. But then again, we can never trust them. West Block, where new inmates are housed, is San Quentin's revolving door. But North Block holds prisoners who are serving long sentences, often for life. Many of these inmates have adjusted to life behind bars. Others have not. And some seek the ultimate escape. Officer Gladson recalls a suicide that took place when he was a rookie in North Block. It's something he'll never forget. Came down about this far, climbed over the bars, and dived head first, straight down, hit the uh, cement. Yeah, there wasn't nothing left of that head when he was done. It was, it was nasty. Uh, most of the suicides are hangers. Uh, they hang themselves right off the bars. Tie uh, the rope around the bar right in here and put it around and then they just lean down. I mean, they're serious about it. <laughs> For some inmates, life in North Block can be structured and peaceful. Worlds away from the chaos of West Block. And North Blockers who maintain good behavior and clean records enjoy special privileges. They can spend much of the day outside of their cells, 
which they're allowed to customize. David Marshall is serving a life sentence for first degree murder. He gives a tour of his four and a half by 12 foot cell. He shares it with another inmate, his celly. This is a uh, cell 4100 in San Quentin, and this is where I live temporarily for now. Uh, I don't have a great view this evening. All right, this is our uh, lovely sink where we shave and uh, do our thing, and we wash up in the morning. And uh, this is our little cabinet that we had done for us. I'm sitting on the toilet. This is our toilet right here that we have. So this is basically our kitchen and our uh, toilet area where we go. Our spice racks over here for our food because I do a lot of cooking, being a WAP that I am. I got to cook to eat. Uh, I hope my porch is clean. We have a tear tender that comes by and sweeps. David is serving the 23rd year of his sentence. He recalls the events that led to his incarceration. Well, I got a murder, first for me murder. I got into a little drug trade and started selling dope on the side. And a little robbery took off against me, so I took it personal. And I kind of hunted him down, found him one night. And that was all that took place. There was no more after that. He was gone, and I got caught. You know, he got what he got out of me, and then I guess I got my redemption. But my redemption got me a life goddamn sense. David's actively involved in rehabilitation programs. He hopes this will weigh in his favor when the parole board decides his fate later this month. I hope you fellas have enjoyed my uh, La Casa, as they would say in Spanish. And uh, maybe you'll come back again and next time, oh, would you like a soda or something with some ice? You guys kind of thirsty? Sure. Okay, let's cut it up then. Let's get some out. Let's get some going here. Let's get that ice out. Some long-term inmates pack their tiny cells with creature comforts. But inmate Kevin Hagen keeps his as simple as possible. Constant reminder of the harsh reality of his situation. I don't want to call this home because it's not my home. It's not my home. Um, I'm in transit here, is what I say. And uh, it's a place where I dwell. It's my dwelling for now. And uh, I try to make it somewhat comfortable, but not too comfortable. Because I never forget where I'm at. As a lifer, Kevin's been incarcerated for over 20 years. He recalls the horrible moment that sealed his fate. Started hanging out with these guys and no drug use here and there. Um, I ended up going on a robbery. So I went, went to rob this guy and uh, the robbery turned bad. And I, you know, you can say you have no intentions of doing anything, but when you're going with a gun, anything can happen, you know. And, uh, I shot him. You know, you're going to carry the the burden always that you took another man's life. And I think it's real important that you don't forget that. you live. I strive and I live from that action as well. So that I don't ever become that person again. There are over 600 men living on death row in San Quentin. All of the inmates here have been convicted of committing heinous crimes. And here they'll pay the ultimate price. Lieutenant Samuel Robinson heads up the Adjustment Center. This is where new inmates live until they adapt to life on death row. It's the most violent place in all of San Quentin. I'm locked away for eight hours with some of the most violent people in the world. I say you come in with your, with your game face on. Uh, uh, it's always a challenge. You never know uh, what to expect, but you always program your mind to face the worst. They've shot darts at us. I mean, they've, made, they've manufactured darts out of, out of staples, out of books, but they've thrown urine and feces on us or, or at us. The prisoner's behavior is as varied as their crimes. Robinson shares his impressions of one particularly high-profile inmate. My interaction with Scott Peterson, when I looked at him, I, I, I referenced Wally Cleaver. Uh, he didn't come across as, you know, some monster or anything like that. He came across as this innocent, suburban type of guy. Peterson seems to get on well with the staff at San Quentin, but his fellow inmates, that's a different story. I think he tried to be cordial and char charismatic with a lot of the other inmate population here. Uh, however, uh, most of them... In this building, they shunned him. He didn't engage in too many conversations in the air. It was mostly because the other inmates wouldn't converse with him. Most prisoners keep Peterson at arm's length, but Sergeant Frayd knows that some inmates would like nothing better than to get in close. 
close enough to make a name for themselves off his celebrity status. What do you think the inmates would do if he was let loose on that yard over there? I believe they would hurt him seriously. They would seriously hurt him. Although the CDC wouldn't permit the film crew to interview any actual death row inmates, inmates on the prison yard are quick to respond to questions about Scott Peterson. Oh, if we had a shot at him? Oh, yeah, that's a trophy. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a trophy right there. <laughs> that's one for the mantle. They crap the f that part. That. What would we do to him? Hey, it wouldn't be pretty. I'd run, I'd run something up in him. <laughs> I'd break something off in him. A pencil. Number two, preferably. <laughs> Sharp it down night, just night. And when you get it in there, you break it off. <laughs> Brutality comes with the territory at San Quentin. Gangs are responsible for most of the violence that takes place. Two highly organized Hispanic gangs wield power here. The Sereños from Southern California and the Norteños from the North. The Norteños, or Northerners, are the largest and most organized gang in San Quentin. When they're involved in violent activity, the entire prison takes note. In West Block, Officer Atkins discovers that two Norteños have been fistfighting. The staff realizes that what seems like a simple brawl could actually have larger implications. We had a fight, a couple of Northerns were in a cell. I guess they came down to cheer. We had to take a, uh, our sergeant had to take a baton to the inmates who were fighting. Northerners have been what we call cleaning house. That's what occurs. They, they find out someone has the wrong, uh, Wrong, wrong kind of crime or to hold on someone, they take care of it themselves. By cleaning house, the Norteños and other prison gangs expel undesirables within their ranks. They also execute perpetrators of taboo crimes, like child molestation. The recent fight could be house cleaning or a signal to other gang members. Officer Gladson monitors the lower yard, the epicenter of gang activity. Okay, straight off the bat now. You look over, and you got your little soldiers out there. You see them with the uh, guard in the corners? Yeah, it's making sure that nobody can creep up on the gangsters. Even in the reception center, the gangs will run things, you know? That's what's going on right here in this corner. And I'm sure if we went around, the white boys and the, uh, the black guys would all be doing the same thing. Everybody's got their little gangsters out. But Nobody does it as obvious as the uh, Northern Hispanics right here. Prison is a complex world unto itself, a world that gangs rule. Inmates segregate into various gangs upon entering prison, and the gangs determine their individual status within the group. At the very top of the hierarchy are the gang leaders. They're called shot callers. Basically, the way the system works is people come in by counties, and you go by your counties, and they have one shot caller that rules the county that you're in. and. Uh, Basically, if any goes down, all the shot callers get together to have a, <laughs> have a shot caller meeting, and then it gets determined what goes down, whether we're going to fight, or somebody gets stuck, or whatever, you know what I mean, what, you know, what's going on. It's, this is be a dangerous place, it's just that it's how you carry yourself, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of stupid shit going on, you know, people come in, and you run in their mouth, and gets handled, you know what I mean? How does it get handled? It just gets handled by... Uh, the hierarchy, the shot callers, is the ones that throw down, throw down the law. When shot callers call for violence, gang members make weapons out of whatever materials are at hand. Stabbing instruments or shanks come in all different shapes and sizes. With necessity spurring them on and plenty of time to craft their creations, prisoners become ingenious weapon makers. Uh, this is a newspaper that's been rolled up and been uh, manufactured into a spear. Um, has a long shaft on it, and on the end here for a tip, uh, it appears that they've used some plastic to uh, heat up and sharpen and roll to a point. One of the reasons that uh, they don't serve steak inside the institutions anymore is because of the bones, uh, which can be manufactured into weapons, and this is one here where it's been sharpened to a point, and they actually use it as a stabbing weapon. San Quentin's staff confiscates hundreds of shanks every year. Most fights never come to the guards' attention, but it's not uncommon to find inmates with stab wounds. Some wear the scars as a badge of honor. 
That's the one right there. there right? Okay, y'all got stab wounds? Yeah, I yeah. got one right here. Right Here's here. mine right here. Bigger one left. Here's mine right here. What kind of weapons? Pencils. Break him off. <laughs> Pencils by ass. This is a knife. Was this all in prison? Prison. Yes. yes. Prison. What was it over? Kill Whitey. Kill Whitey. Kill the white man. You know, I tried to kill it. Can't, can't tell you that. Can't tell you that. First. Can't tell you that. No. We can't. We can't do that. We can't do that. What do you mean? Because I didn't get. I didn't get caught. I mean, I, they didn't catch me. That's the theory. I sewed myself up. Not everyone enters prison intending to commit violent acts. But for some inmates, it's the only way to protect themselves from shot callers. You know, a lot of times the guy who's doing the stabbing doesn't want to do this. But he's forced into doing these things. Uh, the, you know, like the gangs put it to the guy. They'll say, uh, you know what, since you're real good friends with Joey, we want you to stab Joy. And if you don't stab Joy, then we'll stab you. So guess what? Joy's gonna get stabbed. I can help you get rock hard abs like this in less than four months. <laughs> All you have to do is try out my routine. But it takes... Present yourself, young man. Present yourself. But it takes one thing. Hands down, hands down. It takes consistency and dedication. San Quentin's yard is where inmates work out. It's also where they stash their weapons. Officer Gladson surveys the area after a recent fight in West Block. A battle between two Norteño gang members and now rumors of inmates mingling with rival gangs raises a red flag. And a thorough search of the yard is in order. That's the only way you can search. I don't search the whole thing. I just search areas, look for something that stands out. And then, uh, yeah, like a lamb. <laughs> And then you figure you can search from that area. You also have to know who owns what part of the yard. Now, I know the Hispanics own that upper part up there and that bench right through there. They're one of the groups involved. This here, the Samoans uh, take this as their part of the yard. This is Chinese. The white guys are over there. So we'll search that area real close. I like to look at the fence line out there. Uh, this in front of this building that they just put up. That would be an excellent place to look. What happens at night is these guys sit down and lean against the fence, use the fence as a, a backrest on our night yard while they watch the baseball game, stuff like that. Well, while a guy's sitting there, he's digging a hole behind him and putting his weapon down in the hole. And so it just looks like he's sitting up there against the fence because the gangsters aren't going to have a piece that's too far away. They want it close. At any given time, I'd say there's 10 or 15 pieces down this lower yard. It's just that we find them. These guys find pieces down here every week. It's just uh, being able to come back and, and get it the next, you know, where they're going to hide it tomorrow. So it's a game, and we play it. You know, that's their job, and we do our job. Correctional officer Eric Davis finds two items of immediate concern, a shank and what's known as a kite, a small note inmates use to communicate with each other. You see how small they, they print it? Well, it's, it's like, uh, I'll take it into the squad to have them look at it and find out whether it's something or it's nothing, but it's just some little key words that kind of catch your attention, like it says on here, yard, or um, on another piece it says uh, respect and um, you know, another part says, you know, be careful. And then this was just found hanging off of the uh, fence. It looked like somebody had worked it. You don't know if they took it to be weapon stock. That's what they took it for. See how easy that can be made into a, a nice piece. This even being better since it's rounded, they don't have to worry about it stabbing them in the wrist. Investigators will examine the shank and the kite for any clues as to which gangs are involved. With this latest development, the guards are now on high alert. By him getting that and getting that piece, he has stopped somebody from having a bad day. 
all right, because that piece would eventually end up inside of somebody. And, uh, you know, that's just a piece of prison still going into a person's body. And so, you know, Davis don't realize it, that he just, uh, he just saved somebody a little grief, okay? Maybe saved two people a little grief. It doesn't feel good having a piece of round metal stock going into your body. The potential violence is quelled for the moment, but the threatening words on the kite still trouble Glanson. So he heads over to the prison canteen to monitor food sales. They can tell him a lot about the current state of the prison. In San Quentin, actions speak volumes. If prisoners are hoarding food, guards have reason to expect a major incident. Inmates stock up so that if the prison gets locked down, they'll have extra food in their cells. That's just a 7-Eleven never gets robbed, okay? You can buy all your little stuff here. Uh, you, their cosmetics, their, their food, uh, things like that. This is a place that we watch real close. Let's us know uh, this is another indicator place. Uh, if we see the guys stocking up on all food and that's all they're buying, then we know that we maybe have an incident coming. As inmates stock up, the guards know a storm of violence may be on its way. But how and when will it strike? David is also involved in rehabilitation programs, and his clean record means he's eligible to play for the prison baseball team. Only inmates that have maintained a history of good behavior are able to get out and compete on the ball field. During the five-month season, the San Quentin Giants play 35 games. They compete with 12 different teams from the free okay. world. Let's get, let's get busy. What are we going to do now? I sign autographs for eBay. They're only $500 this month. I just come down here today to watch the baseball game, you know. It gets boring up there in the cell block. What channel is that? What is that? Yeah, that was a big exactly. It really helps him a lot, you know. It's kind of like a therapy for him. It keeps him from uh, getting into violence and, and getting too, you know, idle. David Marshall out there that's 51 years old, so, and you can watch these guys play, and at one time, they were pretty decent, you know, to above average ball players. And now they're just old ball players. <laughs> Lucky that fence got barbed wire on it. I would have reached over there and got that guy. Oh, there it is. Ooh, nice play. Go, 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 go. That was a hot one. Ooh. Nice play. Okay, uh, Giants on three. Real loud now, huh? One, two, three, Giants! Woo! Hey, nice job, Bob. Very nice. Job. See you next year, huh? Thank you. Hey, still something, John. <laughs> While Kevin, David, and other inmates work and keep busy with programs, gang members stay busy in other ways. You're late, you know that? Yeah. Back on West Block, gangs often communicate and plan attacks using fish lines, torn up bed sheets that inmates use to toss messages to each other. Okay, that's a fish line, terribly illegal. I'll go up there and charge them $2.71 for destruction of state property. This is how they communicate between the different tiers and, and uh, their friends. And what they'll do is they'll send that fish line, that little scroll, down to the shot caller. And that shot caller will make note of this. They'll put it down in the books of who's going where and who's, what, and who's come into prison. And then that gets somehow out to the streets magically. What's up, gentlemen? That fish line in here? Huh? I ask you a question. Is there a fish line in here? Yes, Let me sir. see your IDs. Is there a fish line in here? Yes, sir. Let me have it. Where's your ID? Where's your ID? You know fishing is illegal, right? We're gonna have to charge you for this two dollars and seventy-one cents, right? It may seem puny to you, but every night I gotta put them in the bed without sheets. And you guys wanna rip them up? It's against the rules. And on this fish line, which may seem insignificant, 
but they could go ahead and put a shank on there. They could go ahead and put their drugs on there. They could pass that note that someone's going to get hit. This is what we have to fight. It's the small things that we have to be aware of here. Since the altercation between the Norteño gang members, illegal activities have been on the rise. San Quentin's Investigative Services Unit, or ISU, is brought in to get to the bottom of things, to prevent what they fear will be a major eruption of violence. This highly trained squad specializes in prison crimes. They search David Marshall's cell after a confidential informant reports that David and his cellmate are allegedly selling items from their cell. If found guilty, David could lose all chance of ever being released from prison. I guess they searched my house or something. You know, didn't find nothing really, because I don't need dope or nothing like that. But uh, they tore it up. So, you know, I got to go ahead and straighten it up. And I got to go probably urinate in the bottle for them. Probably due to my celly. I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I'm kind of upset, but, uh, you know, get over it. David's cellmate, Bruce Cooper, is a member of the Hells Angels. And David believes that's the reason the squad has targeted their cell. Early the next morning, guards search every cell in South Block. Their goal? To find weapons, anything that could be used in a battle between rival gangs. To discourage any violent outbreaks, guards remove all but the bare essentials from the cells. Everything from extra bars of soap to pornography. It does little to dispel the uneasiness that's spreading through the prison. The fellas hate this, this search where we're taking everything out. So this is another reason why we do it. It's because they don't want this. So this is the thing that now maybe they'll think second, two or three times before they want to go ahead and get stupid. Newspaper. Huh? What do you think of that? That's just a newspaper. And uh, it's rolled up so tight. Yeah, it could make a club out of that. Now, you remember I looked up here and he had the Bible? Now, why does he have two? There's people around here that don't even have one. So, yeah, it just makes me suspicious of, uh, of this guy, why he would have two Bibles. He hasn't found that much religion since he's been in prison. Yeah. Throughout the prison, tempers flare and tensions are on the rise. I think that uh, we got a problem. I think that uh, it'll something will eventually happen. Uh, don't know what shift it'll happen on. Probably happen at night on third watch uh, when it's two to ten. Varian White gives voice to the frustration of the inmates. I've heard of somebody jumping off the tier. I've heard about I've heard of I, exactly, there's supposed to have been, within the last month, three or four suicides. Their only concern, if you tell them, is I'm about to kill myself or I'm about to kill somebody else. Guards work quickly to find weapons before someone gets hurt. The ISU hits pay dirt when they uncover a suspicious object underneath a bathroom sink. Uh, they got something out there. What you got, George? Uh, oh, yeah. And then there's some up back in some It's a weapon. The squad finds a toothbrush and a nail that an inmate has made into a shank. Paraphernalia. Well, that's a good find. Better to find it under the sink than in somebody. Meanwhile, over at South Block, a prisoner slashes a fellow inmate across the face with another shank. This time, the guards are too late. Officers quickly search potential suspects for any cuts or scratches on their body. Off camera, an officer speaks to the victim, trying to get information on the assailant. I mean, you're not guilty of anything, okay? You, you're victim here. You're victim. There's nothing that we can do to you. 
We just want to get the guys that did this so, it won't, so nobody else will get hurt. But if you're not going to help us, then we're basically, we're basically done. The victim isn't willing to give up the assailant. Gladson fears the worst. Gangs have squared off. Word has come down from shot callers. And it's only a matter of time before the prison erupts into chaos. During third watch later that night, Gladson's fears come true. A group of Hispanic inmates attack and severely beat a white inmate in North Block. It's uh, approximately 9, 10 in the morning, and the prison is on lockdown. Uh, late last evening, uh, inmate was found in North Block that had been uh, severely beat around the face and head area. Uh, unsure if a weapon was used, but we're, we're thinking maybe, uh, I always like to say maybe a lock and a sock, uh, you know, something heavy, a blunt instrument was probably used on his face. It's either that or they kicked him severely after he was on the ground. By 10.30, the investigators will know what happened. As new details come to light, Gladson gets the latest version of the previous night's incident. Uh, multiple weapons have been found inside that this is a racial incident involving, uh, I guess, uh, last night the Hispanics uh, jumped on the, uh, the white inmate, and this morning the whites retaliated on some of the Hispanics. Before long, word of the fighting has spread to all the guards and the inmates. Then suddenly, a Code 3 alarm sounds, alerting every available officer to respond. This type of alarm only sounds during a major incident. Officers respond as large numbers of inmates fight each other with shanks and fists. The prison goes on full lockdown, and Gladson informs the film crew that it is no longer safe for them to be in the prison. Well, we got to get going. We got a code three alarm, and uh, you know I, we got to stop. So I can't really guarantee you safety. So let's go ahead and get out of here. Where are we going? Gladson rushes the documentary crew out of the prison. For security reasons, they're not permitted to return until days later. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is all over with. Parts of San Quentin are on lockdown as we speak tonight after a big riot erupts involving at least 70 prisoners. This all appears that the brawl was racially motivated. Four days later, after the riot subsides, the prison allows the film crew back inside. Well, it's about 11 o'clock in the morning, and a few days ago, we had a, a major riot down here in the, uh, this is the H unit. This house is the level two inmate. They're actually not supposed to be as violent, but it turned out that uh, they, they got extremely violent. When everybody just got finally all back inside the dorms and uh, were laying down, and they caught a guy, and they sliced him underneath his, uh, started at his ear over here, and followed his jawline around. Now, I believe they were trying to cut his throat, but uh, he probably ducked his head because they followed his jawline all the way around and stopped over around here. Uh, then there was another guy inside the dorm, and he got hit in the head with a blunt object right about this area. It busted his skull up pretty good. These guys uh, knew what they were doing. Uh, they had the showers running. And the reason that they had the showers running, so when the pepper spray started coming, they were uh, jumping over the uh, barrier and just jumping into the showers and getting the pepper spray washed off of them as fast as possible. Oh, they don't want to be out there. Okay. Most inmates will not speak about the riot. However, a Hispanic inmate asks to be interviewed. But before the interview begins, he's called away by a shot caller. Sorry. Uh, thank you. OK, what's happening is homeboy's getting reprimanded for uh, coming up and approaching you guys without permission. He's, he's in a little gangster clique. And uh, now that he's over there getting reprimanded, uh, he'll probably have to stand over there all day and, and make sure nobody approaches them as part of his punishment. Uh, you know, so he's a kid. He's a little kid. Just like what your mother used to do to you when you were young. 
make you stand in the corner, they're gonna make him stand over there in the corner. What a joke. For several white inmates, the reaction is more hostile. So why did the, why did the you know a Mexican guy beat up a white guy? I mean, what are the reasons these things happen? There's about a thousand you're getting, reasons. You're getting into day-to-day -day politics, homie, and you're out of bounds. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yeah. Okay. Day-to-day -day politics, man. You're out of bounds. Don't ask me. I ain't gonna tell you. You why? know why? Because I just told you you're out of bounds. What does that See mean? now you're out of bounds by asking me again. I told you I'm not going to answer you, and, and, and you at, and you come right back and you ask me again. Because now you see, if you jeopardy. was if you was an inmate, you know what? That would be that would be disrespect. Right. And okay? that starts it right there. You know, right. but I know you don't know no better. Right. So I'm going to explain it to you one more time. Some of the shit that goes on in here, man, is day to day politics. A black inmate explains why loyalty plays such an important role in prison politics. We all have friends in other races. But you never forget where your loyalty lies. You know, you, you, you might be in a riot with somebody that you broke bread with out on the streets. You know, it happens. You might uh, have to take somebody down that, that out on the streets, you know, you, you and him share drugs or something. David Marshall has learned to accept fighting and rioting as just another harsh reality of life behind bars. It's prison. Everybody down. It's prison. It happens. After guards search their cells and their urine samples come up clean, David and his cellmates are both cleared of all charges. Yeah, somebody dropped a note, a kite, as they would say. Somebody was telling, saying that we had tobacco and jewelry. There is no, uh, you can't have tobacco anymore as of July 1st. They say we were selling tobacco and buying jewelry. So that it, it turned out to be false. Now with a clean record, David will face the parole board in only two days. Kevin must wait several months before the state determines his future. My whole thing with prison is this here. You can lock my body up. You can't lock my mind up. You can't lock my heart up. You can't lock my spirit up. I'm not going to give you that. I would refuse to give you that. I'm going to keep these good qualities, my compassion qualities about myself so that I am able to help the next guy. Despite the hazards and the monotony of serving a life sentence, Kevin still manages to keep a positive attitude. Well, in general, I, I look forward to another day. You know, not so much that I'm in prison, but it's another day that I'm alive, I'm living, and, and I, I got a smile on my face. I'm not miserable, you know, which you can be miserable, but I don't let my situation dictate my character or how I feel and how I treat other people. I know my time is coming. It's a matter of time. That's all. David Marshall is nervous about the upcoming parole hearing. They just denied three guys this week, 20-something years in. Another guy had 17. Got a couple more guys coming up with 20-plus years in, going to the governors. And that's the part we don't understand. The parole board has denied David in the past. Their reason? His crime, stabbing another man to death, was simply too heinous. Would you consider your crime heinous? Well, I killed a man, so that's not, in itself, is not a, a, a moral act. So, uh, I stabbed him. Mm, I killed him. So I, I'd have to say, you know, just uh, probably, you know, just killing him. Just be, that'd be heinous, just to kill him. Following the riot, a kind of calm settles over San Quentin. It's a mellow yard. It's real mellow. You see the guy playing with the bird, trying to catch it. What I always like to do is when I walk on the yard is to uh, look and see if the people are in the spots that they're supposed to be. I know who hangs out at what areas. If uh, 
if they're not where they're supposed to be and they're over by somebody else when there may be a little problem or something. So, But this is all good. Everybody's right where they're supposed to be. Familiar patterns emerge. A kind of normalcy returns to the prison. Despite their tense relationship, a bond often forms between the guards and the inmates. You need one. Who can cross? Who can cross? Come on, Jesus. No, we're not. Come on. Run, run. Run, 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 run. run. Welcome back to Les Brown. <laughs> this is a world that most people just don't understand. And the way we deal with inmates is a way it's different than maybe on the streets. This is an entire population of people that just, for some reason, just didn't quite do maybe what their parents said or what they weren't supposed to do in school. You know, they did the wrong thing. Yo, what you waiting for? You may, you may go now. I won't get mad. Stop it, young man. Stop it, young man. Comb your hair, eh? I get paid a lot of money to take a lot of On the last day of filming, Officer Gladson shares what an important part of his life San Quentin has become. Yeah, it's, it's plots and subplots, and that's what makes prison great. You know, <laughs> it don't get any better than this. That bell rings for count every day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Every day. Not, I've never seen it not, the bell not ring at count time. That's tradition. That's what San Quentin has that the other places don't. This place has tradition. And uh, I don't think I'll ever leave it.